Greetings, family. My name is Claude Marie Holmes, and I'm your host for Your Work Auntie podcast and Your Work Auntie. Thank you to everyone who is coming back for the fourth time and any new listeners. Welcome to the podcast. If you're new here, my name is Claude Marie Holmes. I am a HR professional in the Washington, D.C. area and have been working in this field for over 20 years in pretty much all areas of HR. And I started this podcast because I wanted to share with you all The people I know and the tips and advice that I've learned in order to really work on transforming my life to be more abundant and, you know, just wanting to motivate and and help you all in any way I can. So this podcast was created for you all because we're all in this together, but I also learned from the topics we're sharing and it also helped me reset my foundation and revisit the goals I've set for myself. So I want to thank you all so much to those of you who are listening for the first time, those of you who are tuning in for the second, third, or fourth time. I also want to thank you for sharing, following, liking, subscribing, providing comments. All of that is so helpful and will definitely help my channel grow and be able to continue to provide you all with access to my world and my friends and everything to really, like I said, just share with you all as a community. If you haven't checked out the last episode, Don't F It Up, Interview Success Tips, I really encourage you to do so after you listen to this episode. I really want to give a big shout out to my guests for those episodes. That episode, it was uh, Mr. Damien Richburg and Mr. Nathaniel Benjamin, who are both people people as uh, stated by Nate. And we were able to share some really great stories and advice on how to successfully interview and not shoot yourself in the foot when it comes to interviewing for jobs in any sector, quite frankly. So really encourage you to listen to that episode or share it with someone that you know is in the interview process. I also want to say to the community, keep sending feedback and ideas. I've received personal texts, emails, comments on different sites about topics that I should cover. And I take that very seriously because this community is for you all, right? So I have been searching for people to cover different topics, and I've also been doing research on various topics so that I can bring you all what you need to help you all again, like I said, grow, improve, and meet the goals you want to meet. So today's topic is resilience, and I'm bringing resilience to you for several reasons. My primary reason is it is the holiday season, and the holiday season is hard for many of us for various reasons. Many of us have experienced losses in our family that makes the holidays hard. And many of us feel isolated. You may not have a family to go to or celebrate with for following reasons. Or you may be looking back over the past year, knowing that the new year's around the corner, with regret, concern, remorse, and even shame about the goals you set out to accomplish and where they are. So I encourage you to listen to this episode and really think about ways that you could be resilient and come back from life's obstacles. And also, more importantly, give yourself grace because we're all out here doing the same things. There is no perfect person. Everyone has a goal missed, a meeting missed. They may have overslept and or whatever it is. Every day, we all have the opportunity to give our very best. And as long as you've given your best, you've, you've done a perfect job. <laughs> So they may not make sense to most, but hopefully you can embrace that for yourself. You being here, you listening, you getting up every day, you moving forward is in fact perfection. So I started writing on this topic of resilience and we'll also get into perseverance and endurance because I was invited to speak on a panel. And on the panel, I was asked to share what my takeaway was as an employee in my sector for, you know, almost 20 years. And then what advice would I give someone that wanted to work in my sector? And when I thought about what served me well, I thought about resilience. I've experienced some challenges and I've been able to bounce back. Sometimes not as quickly as I would love, but I've been always able to dust myself off and keep trying. You know, shout out to Leah. Resilience is a necessary trait to thrive in any environment. So when we talk about resilience today, Even if you're a stay-at-home mom, even if you're a college student, we all need to be resilient. We're all going to face setbacks in and out of the workplace. 
And resiliency is a trait that will really help you persevere or reach your goals. Just to get us all on the same page, something that I like to do, and you'll notice in any future episodes where we're talking about constructs, I like to define them just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Because sometimes we get into semantics and connotations and denotations and all of that stuff. And I really want you to know, here's what I'm talking about. Now, if you define it differently, let me know and share. But I want us to know or us to all agree that this is what Collada is talking about. So the definition that I have for resilience is the capacity to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties, mental toughness. The definition I have for perseverance is continual effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. So based on these, you can kind of see the distinction that resilience is the trait needed to be in action to have perseverance. Because it's hard to have continual effort to achieve if you don't have the ability to be resilient or bounce back. I'm not defining endurance right now because I really want to spend some time on why that word is different. But I know sometimes people confuse it or they tell you to endure. And you'll learn a little bit more later why I don't think you should be enduring because that's not what we want. So the reason resilience is so important, as I've stated, is things change all the time. Your leadership will change. Your favorite boss will leave. Your work bestie will find another job. If you go to AME churches like I grew up in, your favorite pastor might get rotated to another church. Things happen. Your car may break down. I mean, all the time there's going to be change. And change is the one thing that we could bet on will always happen. It is the one constant is change. Sometimes when those changes happen, It impacts the things we're doing or working on or our relatedness. I know for me, when I experience leadership changes, sometimes my projects or my passion projects have to start over. Sometimes I'm told to stop altogether. Sometimes I'm asked to pause to re-engage this new leader or to bring people along. If you work in a government environment, you know that when administration changes, especially among different parties, Sometimes it can completely shift the direction of your agency or organization. Funding for programs may be cut. And while the changes in private sector aren't so politically based, they still happen. When new CEOs come in, when mergers happen, when uh, subsidiaries are purchased or created, things change. So those changes are constant. And, And what I mean by that is when... A new leader came on on board and let's say a project I was working on was canceled or paused because the new leader didn't get it. I learned from those setbacks that when there are transition periods, especially if I have a heads up, I need to prepare a leadership package and do some research, understand what are the, uh, what's the vision, what's important to those stakeholders. Many of us, especially if you're talking VP, assistant secretary level, et cetera, you could generally find speeches or articles or interviews online about that person. And in those articles, they usually talk about what they value and what matters to them. And so by understanding that, I can be ready when they come on board to tell them how this initiative supports the things that they value or align with. And if it doesn't, I could have be prepared that it may not make the cut. Right. But what I've also done is I've decided, regardless of the outcome, that I'm going to take it as a lesson, because sometimes you have an idea that the culture just isn't ready for or you need more resources than they can provide at the time. And so it isn't that it's a bad idea and it isn't really a no. It's just a not right now. Now, you may be there to do the not right now now or someone else may pick up the mantle for you. I mean, if you think about ideas that were ahead of their time a little bit, I think the Palm Pilot for me is always a great example. I had a Palm Pilot. Most people I knew did not. They were like, girl, why are you carrying this ginormous phone? And why do you need all these apps and your email and all of this and that? But now we all basically are carrying around Palm Pilots. I mean, the iPhone, you know, Samsung's, the whatever you have, they have enhanced functionality of what was in fact a Palm Pilot. But at the time, people thought that was too much. It was ridiculous. And I mean, shout out to those guys that developed that. I hope they are very happy somewhere knowing that their technology 
was able to be used and their idea was accepted later. But it's the same thing with the QR code. <clears throat> the QR code was kind of a joke before COVID. I think when it came out, I remember it being really big and a lot of people wanted them. And But then it just sort of fell out of favor because people were like, I don't even need that. I'll just give you my number or I'll just give you the information. But during COVID, when we didn't want contact, the QR code was the tool that we all needed to be able to enable that. And so now QR codes are having a huge comeback and we've been using them for the past four, three, four years now to get information and share information with each other. Those conferences I was in just the other day, that's how we were all connecting to each other. So in the past, I would say, hey, what's your LinkedIn? Can I follow you on LinkedIn? Or what's your email? I'm gonna send you an email right now. And we were able to scan each other's barcodes for both the conference as well as LinkedIn to quickly add these people into our networks and also not exchange business cards. I don't have any business cards. I probably will make a few for some future event, but right now my only way of sharing information is having people scan my various QR codes that I've created to share my information. So because disruption is inevitable, I would say still do the work. Do the work, do your best job. Many things that I started for various reasons ended up being left on the ground floor. Sometimes, like I said, it was due to resourcing. Sometimes it was due to time. Sometimes it was due to my inability to appropriately manage the change, right? So, you know, being real, but I still did the work. And so I also saw those opportunities as an enhancement to my knowledge base, because even though the project may not have gone anywhere or gotten the results that I needed, I still now knew something new. And that something new those are things that I can put on my resume or better yet, be able to use in the future. There, but in my new role, it comes back up all the time. You know, and someone's like, well, how do you know this? And it's like, well, I was asked to do this project 10 years ago or so. Once you have established a knowledge base, or at least you know that it's out there, you could always go back to it and reference that, or at least start following those same breadcrumbs to be able to apply it currently. So be proud of doing the work. I am an idea queen. Um, I remember when I, one of my roles, one of my colleagues gave me a book. Um, I think it was like find your own aces, but the goal was she was like, you have too many ideas and you're interested in too many things. And so this will help you narrow it down. If you know me, you know, I, I didn't read that book. <laughs> Sorry, Donna, but I, I understood that I have a lot of ideas and sometimes it's just not the right time or place for some of those ideas. And like I said, I then looked at why my idea wasn't ready or even I saved myself the pain because sometimes I knew like, okay, given the current resource challenges, I don't think I can implement this, but is there a version B? Is there another alternative? What can I, what can I do? One good example of me trying to implement something that didn't go well due to my lack of change management, which is now the lesson for me, is when I tried to introduce competency modeling into my organization um, and this was maybe 15 years ago. So like it was early in my career and I, and I was like, this is the thing we need to do that we want to help people develop and grow in their careers and build the next generation of leaders. Like I had all the right reasons and I took training, I got certified. I encouraged one or two other people to get certified, but I sold it to my leadership. My leadership was like, we hear you, Claudia, great idea. Let's move forward. But I then took a hammer approach to implementation of this idea. My leader had influence and money and they then basically told or convinced all the other leaders that, yep, you all should do this thing that Kalada's is talking about. It sounds like a great idea. We should do it. I even got signed off from one of the highest departments in, um, in the organization at that time to do it. But it was a fail because I didn't bring the people along that were truly going to be impacted by this change, either through having to create the competencies with me, message the compliment competencies with me, or implement the competencies with me. And as a result, we met for maybe four or five months and did nothing. It was a very circular conversation where I was constantly having to define, here's what competencies mean. You know, it's skills, uh, behavior, well, skills, attitudes, not knowledge, skills, and attitudes. You know, you can't say it's because we had made attitudes mean ability because attitudes was uncomfortable to talk about. And people were also uncomfortable with the term behavioral competency because 
this was new to the culture and it sounded like something where we were, you know, creating bias or judging people in ways that we shouldn't judge them in the workplace. It definitely wasn't the intent, but I wasted so much time trying to explain and give examples in these meetings where had I invested the time up front to one, take a pulse on where my colleagues were, get them the education and resources they needed, respected their concerns and addressed them through, you know, various risk mitigation strategies, they probably would have done that. I mean, since then, they've done a lot of work around that or adopted models from higher up. But at the time, my approach was not successful. And it's commonly something that I, if you ask me in an interview question, what's something you failed at? It's usually that. Um, it's a little bit of an older example now, so I have three more recent ones. But for a long time, it was that. And the lesson I took from that and the way I was able to be resilient is that, okay, if you want to do this in the future, you should do these things. And so there's no shame attached to that for me. And honestly, no embarrassment because it was a lesson that I needed to learn and I needed to still learn it early. And now I know when I implement new things, I make sure everybody involved has as much information as possible. And if I don't, I encourage people to call me out on it and say, I don't know what that is. Then you give me more information or this isn't clear, you know? And so that's something you also want to make sure you have around you too, as people that will let you know where you might have missed the lesson or, or what might be missing in your approach. Some of my ideas didn't even make it that far, but the knowledge, like I said, is still beneficial. I still know that and I can take that knowledge with me wherever I go. Sometimes the idea is planted a seed and so someone eventually picked it up uh, after I left. And I still took pride in that. I was happy when someone called me and says, hey, remember that idea you had three or four years ago? We're finally doing that thing. And then I'll think about, you know, how I could have done something differently. And sometimes the answer is not you. Sometimes the answer is just that the leader at the time didn't have the same vision that you have. And that doesn't honestly mean you've done anything wrong. Sometimes, just like we see in politics, certain people can't be persuaded to move in other ways. And so sometimes it takes a new leader to come in and then people to bring that thing back up to add value. And at the end of the day, I approach work from a value added perspective. So it doesn't really matter if I added the value or person B added the value. It's just that the value was added to the workforce. So if you think about it that way, nothing you do is lost or a true waste of time if you could find the lesson in the loss. And like I said, sometimes it is not you, but be careful of quickly pointing blame, but also be careful of quickly blaming yourself and applying judgment and holding yourself to some crazy high standard that isn't attainable. So, you know, when you need, definitely seek counsel and include people. So for the church people, you know how they say God is an on time God. That is exactly how I felt when I was preparing this topic. I think as I mentioned, I was on a panel and my and in the same day I was on a panel, I was in a conference where the speaker was Kara Harding from the Practice Lab. And she touched on how to build resilience because she was talking about performance and the fact that many of us are struggling. And I was like, isn't that great? Because I'm talking about something that we all need. And I had I started to jot down ideas about how I've built resilience. And many of the things she shared were like right on target because she's a licensed, you know, psychiatrist and, and, and definitely had more experience in helping people build resilience. But also she shared some additional nuggets that I will incorporate into what I've developed to share with you all. So the main thing to build resilience is protecting your mental and physical health. That's easier said than done, right? Because sometimes your mental health being compromised or your physical health is why you are struggling to be resilient. If you are burnt out, exhausted, tired, constantly angry, worried, stressed out, it's going to be really hard for you to bounce back or to learn the lesson and to bounce back, right? And so we really have to do our best to protect these things. And I'll talk only about how to protect these things, but I'll also talk about how you can start where you are. Again, borrowing some language from Kara to really address these resilience goals. So one of the ways that we all know of that many of us don't do is, uh, is getting proper sleep. I am very guilty of not getting proper sleep. I'm often up at really late times of night and then I'm up again in four to five hours in the morning. And so I've tried to be more, you know, 
purposeful with going to sleep and turning the TV off and things like that. But that's still a struggle for me. So I understand it's a struggle for many of you, but it's not something I'm giving up on. Also, just resting, period. Getting rest, taking breaks, having relaxation. One of the things that many of us do, so many of you saw on my website, I use GoodNote 6 and I have a planner. And recently, based on some ADHD-related work and other things, I've started looking more at the daily planning versus the weekly planning so I could do time blocking. But one of the mistakes many of us make as time blockers is we block out the entire day. And we don't give ourselves any time for rest, breaks, um, check-ins with friends or family, surprises. What if you get a call from a friend you haven't talked to in months or years and you didn't give yourself any wiggle room so that six o'clock thing could be pushed to later? Build in breaks. You build in breaks for a meeting running over. Build in breaks for your car having some random issue. Like I went outside one day, I needed to go somewhere and my car wouldn't start. And it threw my entire day off. I was able to call an Uber, but build in breaks, give yourself time and try not to spend so much time rushing from thing to thing. Do that for yourself. I started building in breaks on my calendar at work. Um, so I know that at lunch, other parts of the day, at the end of the day, that's the time that I want for myself. Occasionally, I do allow people to use those times for other purposes if I consider it a high priority. But generally, those times are my time because when I'm working during other times, I give 100 or whatever percentage is my 100 that day. That's what I'm giving. And so I make sure I give myself at the time. I've also downloaded an app. I will share the link in the comments because I don't remember the name, but it's a very simple app. It reminds me to drink water. And sometimes having to go get water means I have to go take a break. Um, you know, we'll, nutrients are important and we'll talk about that. But definitely getting the water you need is so important. And sometimes we're just sitting there at work and we're just powering through. We're not eating, we're not drinking. So give yourself some rest. And then also think about relaxation. What makes you calm? What stimulates you? What creates good sensation? So do you want to color certain times of the day? Do you want to solve word puzzles or crosswords or sudu Sudoku? I have a couple of different things I lean on because I never do one thing for too long. You know, my brain likes to move around a little bit. So I've been coloring in some journals that I've gotten in, in, in good notes. I've also been doing crossword puzzles with the New York Times. I bought the app on my tablet. So I do crossword puzzles. I also do uh, Sudoku. Um, or the Sudoku, sorry, right now, if I mess the pronunciation up, but I do make sure that I have different things to stimulate me. I'm also doing Duolingo, and to some that may not be relaxing, but for me, sometimes the practice is pretty relaxing, especially that I went ahead and just paid for the premium account, so there's really no stress if I get things wrong, and I'm intentionally learning the language. Another thing that I did that I found that people who use like learning as a mental stimulation or relaxation break is taking learning more than one language so i'm actually learning spanish and japanese because when i get tired of learning spanish or i'm frustrated or over the lesson i can go to japanese and learn that and then even within the japanese there's a set of lessons specifically focused on learning the letters and then there's a set of lessons focused on learning the words and so i go between those as well depending on my mood, whatever level of stimulation I need. So whatever's relaxing or fun to you, and that's different for everyone. For some of us, it's listening to music. It, you know, it might be bird watching or, or sitting by a lake or river. If you are still lucky enough to work from home, go work outside somewhere. Go work in your local park if it's quiet during certain times of the day. And that's something easily that you, that you can suss out. Find a little meeting day, go to the park. See how busy it is. The park near me is actually very quiet during the day. One or two runners, maybe one or two dogs, but not enough to be disruptive to any meetings or work that needs to be done. So you definitely want to make sure that you're, again, getting rest, relaxation, or fun, unplugging in some way. The other thing you need to think about is going outside. My friends who are listening to this will tell you, and I'll tell you, I'm not a big fan of outside. Um, outside is often too people-y and I know I just told you I go to parks but the other reason I like going to the park in the day is because there was no people there but go outside anyway and you may be forced to interact with your neighbors you haven't talked to they don't even remember you live in the building 
But get outside, get some fresh air, read something. If you have a dog, go walk your dog. Go on a little bit longer of a walk. Instead of just going outside and to poop and straight back, head out beyond the gate. Walk on the streets nearby if it's safe for you and you know you have everything you need to feel safe. Like let's go go do that. Breathe in the fresh air, put on your appropriate amount of sun protection. Get that vitamin D, especially if you are a person with melanin. Um, you, we need that vitamin D directly from the sun at least 15 minutes a day. So get outside, plan a hike nearby. Most of us are lucky enough to have parks or trails nearby. Go do one, get your friends together, get a group together, go on meetup.com. There's tons of hiking, biking, riding groups. And also a good side hustle that also forces you to be outside is walking dogs. So if you are a pet person but don't have pets yet, go walk somebody else's dog and get that sunlight and vitamin D for a little bit of cooling. In addition to being outside and walking in general, you want to just move. Move your body, loosen it up. You want to stretch, try yoga, take a Zumba class, walk on the treadmill. I have a treadmill and a Peloton bike. Um, we haven't been that closely acquainted for the last <laughs> few months, but it is something that I am working on and definitely getting up and getting moved to get that adrenaline pumping, get that cardiovascular flow in. It's, it's something that we all should be doing to definitely keep yourself motivated, feeling good and boost your brain and the good chemicals that go around. You know, all of these things will help you be more resilient. If you feel good, if you're happy with your outcome towards your goals, your body goals, your wellness goals, those all help you be a little bit more resilient. Eat well, get the nutrients that you need, the vitamins you need. Eating well is something that I struggled with because I also struggled with the rest and taking breaks. And so I would work straight eight, nine, 10 hour days with no food, no drink, maybe a couple of bathroom breaks and nothing. And so that's why I, like, I started adding the things to my calendar, creating the apps, also turning to um, meal kits and meal services for when I didn't feel like cooking because I wanted to prioritize other things. You know, really recognizing where in my life I needed balance or support from other tools, you know, that I could use or afford. So really just, you know, finding ways to get the nutrients I need. Now, some of you live in food deserts and some of you don't have the money for meal kits or someone to cook meals for you. And so there's other ways to achieve this. There are communities on Facebook, even on Etsy, um, from some YouTube channels where they share seeds. And think about possibly home gardening. Home gardening could also be very relaxing and, and also something that would create more sensation and you know, create happiness for you because you're creating life without giving birth, right? So <laughs> it's a good something that you can look into that may also have other impacts besides just providing you nutrients and food. A YouTuber I watch named Sunday Love actually shares a lot about her home garden where she's growing things that work for her in um, her autoimmune disease. I believe she has an autoimmune disease, but she has some health concerns. And so she you know, has to eat a certain way and she wants to make sure she's really protecting her body against the impact of that health condition. And so check Sunday Love out if you haven't watched her videos. They're short, they're great. She also has a guide available on her website about home gardening. There's also so many YouTube channels dedicated to that, as well as Skillshare. Uh, Skillshare has instructors and courses about home gardening, what's easy to grow. I had a hydro garden for a while myself where I was growing mint and herbs um, that I use the most frequently. And it was nice to see the fruits of your labor. A hydro garden is slightly less maintenance than, let's say, a true dirt garden. But either way, I was producing something. I actually only got rid of the garden because, you know, we were getting bugs in here and I was not about that life. So I paused on that. But recently I bought other plants in the house. And so they're not fruit bearing plants or vegetable plants, but I'm still getting that joy from seeing the plants that I've nurtured grow and then learning from, you know, different people like my mom and other groups about like how to grow and keep them alive and supplying them with nutrients. I also downloaded an app because, hey, I'm going to use all the technology to help me and it's called Planta and Planta has also helped me keep my plants alive by telling me 
when to water them, what signs to look for, if they're unhealthy. Also, you know, I've done research following other channels of like, well, how to like keep them bug free and all this other good stuff. So definitely consider that. Now I get it. Many of you are like, I'm not trying to be Farmer Brown Colada. You tripping. I hear you. So what are some creative ways to get the nutrients that you need, but that fits into your life? One of the things I used to do with one of my work colleagues is we would do um, lunch kind of sharing. So I would cook one or two days a week. They would cook one or two days a week. And then we would bring each other lunch, lunches. And that allowed us to not have to cook three or four meals on a weekend or throughout the week in order to feed ourselves. And it also provided us with variety. So I would cook the dishes that, you know, they loved that were my favorite or I was known for. And then they would cook some of their dishes that I loved and favorite. And, you know, in that way, it was a way for us to both get the nutrients we need without having to be in the kitchen every single night. So be creative and, you know, talk with someone about possibly doing that. If you want us to have more money at your disposal that you would like to use, I do recommend Cook Unity. I think they have really good meals, a good variety. If you are more um, in the mind of simple meals that are keto friendly, you know, high fat, low carb factor is great for that as well to make sure you're getting what you need. Also, if you are willing to ki- uh, cook, but you don't want to go to the grocery store, of course, you have kits like HelloFresh um, and uh, so many, so many others. I can't even think of all the names right now that you could enjoy so all i'm saying is find a way don't be a victim to your circumstance because you live where you live and unless there's a plan to immediately change that then we have to figure out a way right so let's not be stuck with excuses i also found that because i wasn't taking breaks and getting rest i would also binge and so i've struggled with my weight for a long time and so i've thought of ways to make that a little bit easier for me so maybe there is a day where I schedule many meetings back to back because that still happens sometimes sometimes that's life and I make sure I created a snack corner for myself a little like healthy high protein snack it's not too far from my desk and so I can get up and grab that snack throughout the day so that when the work day ends I'm not overeating or ordering out something crazy because when I was not eating during the day I was spending a lot of money with meal delivery services like Uber and DoorDash, which really does add up and cuts into other things you want to do. Like I'd rather travel and see the world than eat my way through all of the local restaurants because I'm not cooking or eating throughout the day. Um, I order a lot of my high protein snacks right from Aldi. So I'm not spending a ton of money. And I also, you know, um, will go to Trader Joe's for trail mix and other things. And so there's definitely ways to get affordable snacks and things like that. However, my affordable may not be your affordable. So let, find an option that works for you. One of the most important things to resilience really is connection. Many of us are lonely and unconnected. And some of it is because we're struggling to bounce back and we're constantly worrying about our work and what we're doing and what other people think and all this other stuff. Some of us have trauma left over from childhood and and adulthood or even yesterday where we're just not trusting the people around us to have our best interests at heart. And as a result, many of us have shallow, very surface level relationships if we have them at all. And so I encourage you to open up your friendships and seek resources or ways to do that and have conversations with your, your friends about what you want your friendships to be and what you need from them. Sometimes your friend is only giving you what you get or, or what they think you want. And so it's okay to have that friendship to see if you could take it to where you need it. If you need them to give you more advice, you want them to hold you accountable, if you trust them. And also as a friend, when someone reaches out to you and they're complaining or they're venting or whatever, ask them what they need from you. Do you need me to give you advice? Do you want me to just listen? Do you want me to just be a shoulder to cry on? and comfort you in this time. But also ask them, do you want me to help you get through this if I see an area where you could possibly could take action or do something different? And I think I don't often ask my friends this, you know, um, as well, but it's something I'm trying to do more so that I can give people the attention they need. Because another thing we do is we take calls from people 
and as friends and we're not in a place to be there for them. We're in loud environments, talking to other people in the background, we're driving in the car, trying to pay attention. And while some friends really need you in that moment and you could say, hey, do you need me right now? Because then because I love you, I can make time for you right now. Or is this something where I can call you back as soon as I'm in a place where I can give you a full attention? I mean, ask, because if someone just broke up with their significant other and they, they think they're never going to be able to breathe again, they might need you to pull over or at least get in a, a lane where you could definitely give them the attention they need. So, you know, ask the question because friendship works both ways. And so we have to communicate with each, to each other what we need. And you also have to ask just to make sure that you all have the same level of understanding. I am lucky to have an amazing set of friends. Like my best friend, Ema, I wish everybody could have an Ema. The way Ema knows how to hype me up and acknowledge the accomplishments I have when I don't even sometimes do it and asking me to pause to really celebrate and recognize my wins is just such an amazing strength. And it doesn't feel cheesy. It doesn't feel fake. It always feels like love. But that same Ema will call a spade a spade. So when I'm talking to her and I'm telling her about things I'm going through, she's going to help me really understand or at least think through how what's happening and then how what we can do about it. And I try to, and I do the same for her. I don't think I'm as good of a, as a hype person. You know, she, she's definitely a very much a fag. But it's like so appreciated. And I wish that everybody can find an Ema. In addition to Ema and my other really great friends, I have an accountability partner and friend named Dewana. So shout out to Dewana. And Dewana and I are accountability partners because we both went through a leadership development program together. And so some of the language we use in the program is very specific to the program. And Eva hasn't gone through that program, I'll say yet. And so I wanted an accountability partner that could really help me work on the muscles that I have in that program. And the amazing thing about Dewana is because sometimes I'll be talking, talking, talking. And even when I was preparing for this episode and I started to talk about endurance, as we'll talk about later, she called me out. She was like, um, I, I thought you said you didn't want people to endure. So why are you enduring? I couldn't say anything to that. And not only does it, and her ability to say back to me what I said wasn't a spiteful or hateful way. It really was an acknowledgement of what I was standing for, for others, and then helping her, helping me do it for myself. And like I said, I'm not perfect. And the things I'm sharing today, I still struggle with, but I'm sharing it with you so we can struggle together to work through this so that we are truly resilient people that are able to persist and persevere. So I would encourage you to surround yourself with friends who not only can give you real feedback, Friends that know when to be cheerleaders. Friends that don't encourage mess or gossip. And I know we all like some good tea, right? I love a good story. I like to tell a good story. But sometimes the focus on telling stories and minding other people's business is what is holding us back. It may also be stealing our joy as we're creating scenar scenarios and conspiracies and making ourselves the victim in situations that really don't exist. So definitely find that circle. And if you haven't found that circle, Oftentimes, I'm from a small town, and sometimes I see from people in the small town is their friends are just who they have no choice but to be friends with. And because of that, some of them are into really what I would say toxic friendships. And if you're from my hometown and you're listening, if that's not true for you, congratulations. But I think that one of the greatest things that I'm glad for is that when I left my small town, I learned more about myself and what I needed in a friendship. So when I was able to re-engage with my friends from high school, et cetera, I was able to engage with the boundaries and the things that work for me. And so sometimes when you are in the, around the same people the whole time, even if you're growing in a different uh, direction, you may not, may not feel safe in going in that direction. So I really do encourage you all to really think about how, that those friendships. Use social media. Like I said, it's several episodes ago. I've met some amazing people online that I've never met in person in some cases. Some of them I have. I have one friend that I've met on the internet. The first time I met her in person was at her wedding. She invited me to celebrate one of the most special days of her life, of her life in person because of the friendship we built online where I was a confidant to her 
she was a confidant to me. We supported each other. We shared ideas um, and had some good laughs, uh, you know, all in all. But really, if your community in close proximity isn't giving you what you need, use the internet to your advantage. If we could meet people on the internet romantically, um, doggone for sure you could meet a friend. Look for groups for things you like to do. For me, one of the things I love to do is some of the more nerdy things. And right now in my current circle, like comic Cons and things like that, all, not all of my friends are into it. Some of them, they're into it at different levels. And so I know if that's something I want to do socially, I'm going to have to expand my friendship circle so that I can go. I'm also a huge theater person. And for years, I was going to the theater by myself when another person I met on Twitter named Jessica, who we used to live locally, shared with me, hey, if, you know, I also like the theater. I can, let's go hang out. And we had only hung out or met each other maybe one or two times, but until she moved away, like she was my theater buddy. We saw everything together you know, went to every big production. And DC gets lots of musicals and productions. And we were going to see most of them together. And so now that I finally had someone to go with and I wasn't just sitting in theaters by myself, which is nothing wrong with doing things by yourself. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is it was nice to have someone to share those moments with, maybe do dinner before or after, and not just be sitting in the car moving back by myself. So in a future episode, I am going to actually talk about how to build healthy relationships and maybe give you guys some more tips and examples. But right now, I want to talk about how you can start building your resilience. The first thing I will say and reiterate from before is give yourself grace in all of this. Remember that no one out here is a perfect person. Just like I'm admitting here, I still struggle with the things I'm sharing with you, but I know ultimately me continuing to try to build those muscles in me will help me be more resilient and be able to be there more for the things I want to be here for, like this podcast, like for you all, um, like in the training or consultancy areas that I, I have in my life. So this is really about me knowing that I need to continue to push myself so that I can achieve the results I want to achieve. And not all your results have to be career oriented and other stuff. And you just want to be more resilient just so you can breathe better, sleep better, be happier. That's good too. So what Karen shared is you want to start where you are for building resilience and choose the thing that works for you. So if therapy is something that speaks to you, then choose therapy. I have a great therapist and I'm happy that I found her during COVID, uh, you know, because with all the loss and all that was going on, I was having difficulty managing my grief and and then, you know, and, and it was compounding with some other stress in my life. And so I found a therapist. Coaching may be better for some of you. And just like therapy, there are different kinds of coaches that will focus on different aspects of your life. There's like whole life coaches. There's professional coaches where they're focusing mostly on career. There's also wellness coaches, life coaches. So there's so many options. So find those things for you. Also consider peer coaching or mentoring. And again, that's having a relationship with someone that you trust, that you can share your life with and get meaningful feedback, advice, and mutual sharing that is in a way that will help you grow. You can also, like I have the accountability partner, especially if you're currently in any sort of leadership or development program. Oftentimes we take these courses and we're like, oh, that's so great, that's great. I'm gonna make an action plan. And then it becomes another sheet of paper that sits on the desk. And then in a few months, you spill some coffee on it and then it's in the trash. And then you didn't implement any of those things because you didn't hold yourself accountable to. You just sort of in the moment were like, that sounds great. And so if you are doing something like that already, ask someone in the program if, that you connect with if they want to be your accountability partner. Having a mentor is also really good. Um, again, mentors generally focus more on the career side of your life but they can definitely share tips and advice about relationships, navigating certain work cultures, advocating for yourself. And so there's just so many resources out there. Journaling is also something, if you're not comfortable sharing with someone else yet, maybe you're comfortable sharing with yourself. So choose a journal that works for you that current encourages reflection and put it in a safe space. And hopefully you are with people that keep, that your stuff is safe with, right? You don't have to wonder where your journal is. I use my tablet for planning and journaling now. I'm not a huge journaler. 
I never have been. I The only time I've consistently journaled is when I had to journal when I was in um, my doctoral program for one of the courses. But otherwise, yeah, I'm just not a big journaler. So for, sometimes I definitely will journal if something's really heavy on my mind, but it's not for me. But if it's for you, definitely do that. Um, also look at journaling that's combined with things. The journal I bought recently that I'm trying to incorporate into my routine has coloring involved. So sometimes when I don't want to write, I can still reflect while coloring about what, how today was and maybe answer some of the daily question prompts. So yeah, find a journal that works for you. If, again, if money is the issue, if you have a tablet, the GoodNotes app, I think is $9 or so. Also, Five Below and the Dollar Tree and Home Goods often have journals for the low. Also, if you don't care about dates and you're okay with whiting out and redating, check the clearance file in your local Michaels or office supply store for journals that have been dated for the previous year. Um, so do whatever you need to get that if that is something you want you want to bring back into your life is journaling. Also, body movement in some way are things that provide body stimulation. So you want to move whatever movement is. And that was something I actually worked on with my nutritionist is I had to find movement so rigidly that when I didn't move in those particular ways, I made myself feel bad. And so we talked about movement is just movement. So if I want to dance for 30 minutes, if I want to walk, if I want to run, if I want to ride a bike, if I want to hula hoop, if I want to roller skate, movement is movement. If I want to walk up and down the stairs, yes, some movement burns more calories, but at the end of the day, it's the movement itself that is so important and makes you feel good. Sensations. Do you need a nice massage to relax and reflect or one of those like uh, EMS devices or Theragun or will candles and essential oils help motivate you and, and you know enhance your sensory perception and feelings from around you one of the things I love to do when I go to Puerto Rico is there's an oxygen bar and they let you breathe oxygen and you get different essential oils directly in that it's such a relaxing euphoric feeling and it just makes you feel really really good um I use both doTERRA and Revive oils. Um, those are some of the, some highly rated oils that I've used. I know there's also, I think, Why Young Living or something is the name of another. But yeah, try scent, um, scents to boost your energy or create calmness in your space. There's also um, candles that have like CBD in them and, and other natural herbs and other things to really just help you feel calm and relaxed. And they do work. So, and they may not work for everyone, but they did work for me. Meditation is also great. Peloton has some really great meditation. If you, you know, are willing to download the app or already have the app. Um, they also have some really great sleep meditations that people said they've been able to fall asleep on time night after night um, by listening to these, I think by Russ is the instructor's name. So find some way to enhance the sensory feeling or movement of your body but whatever works for you what do you feel most comfortable with what speaks to you right away and we've already talked about this but go outside be one with nature go camping I mean you could go glamping I get it I don't like spiders I don't like snakes I also don't like pitch darkness because it may be filled, filled with spiders and snakes so I get it but you know how does how is nature for you is it going to one of those um, butterfly sanctuaries? Is it going to the zoo? Like, is it just going to the beach? Whatever way you can get back with nature is great. And like I said, also consider becoming a plant mom. Also consider retreats as a way to get away, regroup, connect with people that are like-minded, learn new tools that can help you address some of these other areas like ways to journal bo and body and mind connection and things like that, as well as any development courses that can also focus on those kind of tips and tricks that you may need. In the comments below, in the comments below, tell me where you are starting to build resilience. What are your ways that you build resilience? What tools are you going to use? Is it therapy, coaching, mentorship, movement, journaling, reflecting, going out in nature? Is it a retreat? Is it a development course? What, where's your start? How are you starting? So please share in the comments below. 
to let me know where you're starting. So now we're back to persistence. And as I've stated stated earlier, persistence requires resilience. As you'll recall, pers- perseverance is a continual effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. Be persistent about your career goals. Know your why. For some of you, it may be helpful to develop a personal mission statement. I used to teach a course on this, and I'm actually going to share the handouts in the description bar below. So please use those handouts to answer the questions to really start helping you think of what you value and what you find important and develop your personal mission statement. And this may help you align your goals and think about ways in which you need to persevere in order to continue to meet those goals. The questions are, what is important to me? What do I value? What are my roles in life? What are my strengths and talents? And lastly, at the end of my life, what do I want to have accomplished? So while I want you to persist in being resilient, I do not want you to endure. You might say, Claudia, that sounds like the same word, but it's not. And you know, I love to set, you know, a definition out. And this is not a Colada definition. This is Merriam-Webster. Endurance or endure is defined as suffering, (laughs) something difficult or painful. I don't want you all to be in a state of endurance. It means that you're not bouncing back. It means that this, something is unsolvable or not being resolved. And so you are in pain. And I'm not talking about people who are in pain from chronic illnesses or things they cannot control, but I'm talking about those of you who can be a cause of the matter or take action to bring yourself back to a place of resilience and perseverance and not endurance. Now, if after you evaluate the situation, it's not resolvable, then my other thing is to say you need to move on. So let's talk about that. If you aren't doing life, your job, your relationships, I want you to know that you don't have to. I want you all to be encouraged to find the power to make a difference in your life. First of all, I want you to do a reality check and make sure you understand what what you think happened is actually what happened. What was said versus what you decided what it meant. And in some cases, there are things that we all know about, like microaggressions and other terms where people intentionally and unintentionally are saying things to be harmful or hurtful. And so those things do happen. And so in those situations, my question to you is, have you spoken up? Have you addressed it? Now, in some environments, you may be concerned if you don't feel safe addressing it or doing anything about it. And then I will say to you is if you are in an environment where you don't feel safe or addressing it, there is no way for you to take action in the matter. So this is when you need to look for what is my exit strategy to move on in this situation. So also, you want to be clear about setting boundaries and making sure that you set boundaries. I am so guilty of being like, well, they should know, they should have known, and it should have been this, and it should have been. None of that is true. What they should have or could have is not what happened, right? So then I need to be clear about what my expectations are. Did I properly communicate what my expectations are? Did I share my concerns? Did I tell them what my best practices were? And so there's, and there is varying levels of how much I'm willing to do, depending on the level of the person or, you know, what other expectations have been made clear. And so you have to use your, you know, some judgment and um, and be and, and really think carefully about, you know, what you're conveying because you also don't want to be overbearing where you're always telling people exactly what to do with every single thing because you want it to be done your exact way, right? So make sure you're not doing that. Um, when I first started therapy, one of the things that we worked on was the fact that I wasn't being assertive. I was so frustrated with my life and the people in it because I was not speaking to my needs. I was allowing life to happen to me and then I would go off and mumble and grunt and be upset and all this other thing. And I will tell you, I first started therapy over 10 years ago and given some tools I've gotten recently, I've really just been able to come over the other side of that and really start speaking up and using my voice with power in certain places. Like there's a lot of places I was speaking up, but sometimes when it came to like a feeling thing, I was a little more hesitant because I didn't trust that people would 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 respond to my feelings or concerns the same way they do to some of my facts and knowledge. I do want to stop here and also give you another definition to think about. And because people sometimes confuse assertive and aggressive. But you can be assertive without being aggressive. The definition I'm using here is the process of understanding 
one's own thoughts and feelings, needs and wants, and being comfortable expressing those things in appropriate um, in appropriate ways in relationships with others. Being assertive is a muscle you have to grow and not think too hard about it. Because we're so used to people pleasing and having considerations and, and not wanting to offend or sacrifice our feelings for others, we sometimes play psychic and assume we know how the information is going to be received or you know, just know that it won't be received well. And you may be right, but you won't know for a fact until you share that concern or that thought or that information. As my therapist back then told me, as long as you're respectful and tactful, you can't be concerned with how it is received. I'm sure some of you in the comments are already like, hell no, that sounds really selfish. But my whole thing is, is, is if you are expressing something tactfully and respectfully, respectfully as a boundary that you have, a concern, something you need or want from the people around you, and they get upset, how is that your problem? So really think about that and think about people you haven't been assertive with in your life, including coworkers, including bosses, and work on that. Often, some of the reasons we feel like we're enduring at work is that we've made up stories about it being only me. I'm the only one that's treated this way. I'm the only one that's given negative feedback. I'm the only one that was denied a promotion. I'm the only one. But you have no proof of that. So you're spending time being upset about something that literally you just made up. You put on your Shonda Rhyme hat, your M. Night Shyamalan hat, and you decided you were going to write the script and create a soap opera. And now you're suffering from that soap opera or script you created. I'm not saying don't trust your gut or research or get facts, but it really isn't helpful to ruminate over something that you literally have no real proof of. And sometimes it's not your business. I often hear this, I'm the only one when I give feedback. Well, no one else is being told, how would you know? As a supervisor, I cannot tell you that employee B is messing up and I told them this is that. I mean, I shouldn't, so I'm sure some supervisors do, but I wouldn't tell you that. So, and even if you come and tell me what that person has done, I might say, thank you for telling me uh, that, you know, I'm concerned about that as well. I may acknowledge the fact that it's a concern or whatever, but I'm not telling you how I'm, I'm addressing it. It's not really for you to know, right? So focus on you and the things that matter. You can only really change you. I, at the moment, I'm only holding you accountable. The real question is not, are you the only one? But is the feedback reasonable? Is it founded in truth? Is it based on anything other than your work, such as your gender, race, sexual preferences, or whatever? Those are the real questions. And if those answers are yes, then you have a couple of options. You can speak up to address it through whatever the appropriate channels are, or you can remove yourself from the situation. And don't feel bad. Not all of us have it in us to fight all the time, the injustices and things like that. And I know some people in my comments will probably not agree with me, but I can't expect everybody to be Rosa Parks. Some of us really just got up and walked to the back, of, you know, the back of the bus. So, and and I think I have to respect that choice in, in the moment. So, if you focus on facts, it makes things so much easier. Like I have feelings about a lot of things, and I get annoyed about a lot of things, and sometimes I make assumptions about things. But at the end of the day, if I focus on what actually happened and try not to dwell on the story that I made up it usually makes it easier for me to bounce back or, you know, figure out my next uh, step. So like I said, if after you evaluate reality and take back your power by being assertive or making a choice, like if your choice is that I'm just going to move on, then do that. Make a plan to leave. One of the most frustrating things for me as a coach and mentor to many people are the people who are just like, I hate my job so much. This is the worst job ever, blah, 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 blah. And they just keep talking about how bad it is, how awful everybody is. And then they have no plan to leave. Now, let's say you are in a situation where you don't have many job opportunities and leaving really isn't an option. Is there someplace else within the organization that has a different culture, a different supervisor, or whatever you need that might make the situation better before you consider quitting? Have you pursued those opportunities? If you don't like the leader, have you also pursued leadership? Maybe it's your time to step up and lead and ask for the training and opportunities that you have. And I know it's easier said than done, but I really encourage you all to be powerful and take control of these matters and not let it just happen to you. 
because the more control and power you take back in these situations, the more resilient you'll feel. In my current role, I went through a period where I was enduring. I was pretty much suffering. Um, it impacted how I related to everybody. Um, with some coworkers and other things, I was pretty good at hiding it. Some coworkers became confident, um, confidants. Some of my former colleagues and peers and besties, it was a lot of concern and feelings like I wasn't doing enough or it was just too much. And then I really had to think about who said it was too much and who told me I had to work 12, 15 hour days. And I'm not saying this as a flex, I'm saying this to be real. I work the least amount of hours I have probably ever worked in my life. And I am just as productive or productive enough to still feel good about my accomplishments as I've ever been. In the last two months, I took off about, I think maybe 40 hours over a period of six weeks um, not 40 hours, about 80 hours over a period of six weeks because I had some things to take care of with personally and my family. And I, the days I was on, I was on. And the days I needed to be off, I was off. And if I peeked in, it's because I chose to. And so I got rid of the had to, or I need to, or I must do, because at the end of the day, these choices are mine to make. I choose the number of hours I'm willing to give to the job or the role. Now, again, you may be in a circumstance where you're not choosing and you're being forced to. So that's, that's the reality. If you're being forced to and you cannot reclaim the balance and you're stressed out and, and you're having to work constantly and the deadlines are unreasonable, you have options. You have options to speak up, be clear. You have options to set boundaries um, that you're going to manage. Boundaries, again, are not about telling pe other people what not to do. It's about how you'll respond if they do things that outside outside of your boundaries. For example, when I get emails after five o'clock, I don't read them unless I'm online. If I chose to work late that day, I read it. But if I didn't choose to work late that day, that message sits until the next morning. I don't think about it. I'm not stressed about it. I'm not concerned. Am I still one of the most productive and responsive people in my organization? Yes, I am. <laughs> because I choose to really focus on the things that matter and the amount of time that I've allotted that is, you know, just above or right around the 40 hours that I'm being paid for. And yes, there are still weeks and times where I pull a late, I work a late night, or I even might hop on a Saturday. But now I know that it was my choice. Or I've, not even that I know, I've accepted more that it was my choice. And I can't blame or be upset because I chose, you know? So again, choose things that work for you. I recently had an employee ask me, how I got so much accomplished and and I, and I jokingly said I must have finally tapped into the hours Beyonce has in her 24 hours because I do feel very accomplished like I feel really good about myself I mean I've been able to start this podcast attend a leadership course speak on a panel plan a birthday trip plan other things and I don't feel really like super stressed out have there been things that I didn't do yes have there been goals that I didn't meet yes but all I can do is accept the fact that that didn't happen, make a new plan, commit to plan and execute. And also be more realistic about the plan. So that's what I've been doing. And so that's what I'm saying to you all. It's really about taking back that power, being in action, recognizing the choices that we make. I, I'm honestly in such a good space that one of my employees thought I was about to quit because I was so happy compared to, you know, how some of our interactions a few months ago. And I will say that made me pretty happy that someone could recognize the overall happiness and an approach to work that I've taken where I'm not letting every little thing frustrate and upset me um, and, and just being really high strung about it. And, you know, it's really about like what's important to me you know, and, and what is what is still success for the organization. And being clear about that. Many of you might be struggling because you don't know what success looks like for your job, right? So ask. And if, and if your manager can't define it, because some managers get to management and don't always have the ways or tools to help you, you define it. That's where those coaches and those peer mentors come in and then you confirm with them, is this what success looks like for you? Because this is what success is for me. I actually encourage people to do that, like especially for people that are super high achievers and they want to get above the the level three, which is the successful performance rating. I've always said, if you want to be above successful, 
you need to have your co- a conversation with your manager to make sure you understand what above successful looks like. What opportunities can you take? What goals should you set if you want to be above successful? And being very clear and certain about that. So again, choice, communication, and being assertive are things that would definitely help you all feel like you're not enduring. So I will wrap this podcast up by saying, I hope this was helpful to someone. I hope that if you are in a situation where you feel like you're enduring, whether it's work, whether it's a relationship, um, whether it's a volunteer org, because some of us are, are putting in some hard time in volunteer orgs that are really impacting our ability to meet goals, and other and things in other life are our overall joy, relatedness, even like building new relationships. Ask yourself what happened. What did I say? It, what did I make it mean? What I can do about it? What is what is an action I can take to address this concern? Whether that means being assertive and setting boundaries, or if it means finding something else to do. And one of the things I had to get over is quitting things and feeling like I was a loser or that I didn't hold up my end of the bargain by quitting. But sometimes things didn't serve me. It didn't serve me spiritually, mentally, or professionally. And I had to let those things go and not be concerned with how others feel about it. So if you are doing something or in a situation where you have taken action or decided that there is no action to take, do what you need to do to make an action plan. Because there's so many, you're going to be have to be an action in some way. But to make an action plan to be, to exit that situation. So I want everyone to be encouraged. Know that we're all in this together. And during this holiday season, I hope that I've given you all a gift of ways to build resilience or continue to enhance the resilience that you need in order to persevere and reach the goals in your life. And the strength to know that endurance is not acceptable. You shouldn't be suffering and you shouldn't be in pain in any of your life things or buckets. Again, thank you all for listening. If you made it this far, I really do thank you. This is one of my longest solo episodes, but I really wanted to make sure that I shared truthfully and honestly, as well as give some examples. If you have any further questions, if any of you listening would like to jump on a future episode to talk about this as well, I'm hoping to, cross your fingers, get Kara on herself to talk about her work she does um, because, I, like I said, it was very on time and something that I really was so excited to be able to incorporate into what I was sharing today. So again, thank you. Be blessed. Have a happy holiday season. And be blessed.